Welcome everyone this morning here in the name of the Lord is today. We find ourselves 50 days after Easter, so we're celebrating the great festival of Pentecost, and that God now is pouring out his Holy Spirit upon us, and we'll see just what that means for the early church and for us today, and that'll be the focus of our sermon then this morning. So we begin our worship then with our opening hymn, O Holy Spirit, Enter In. Invocation the confession of sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us then confess our sins unto God our Father. I, a poor sinner, plead guilty before God of all sins. I have lived as if God did not matter, and as if I mattered most. My Lord's name I have not honored as I should. My worship and prayers have altered. I have not let his love have its way with me, and so my love for others has failed. There are those whom I have hurt, and those whom I have failed to help. My thoughts and desires have been soiled with sin. 
I am sorry for all of this and ask for grace. I want to do better. God be merciful to you and strengthen your faith. Amen. Instead of by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, on this day you once taught the hearts of your faithful people by sending in the light of your Holy Spirit. Grant us in our day by the same Spirit to have a right understanding in all things, and evermore to rejoice in his holy consolation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Maybe seated then for readings. We begin our readings then today on the day of Pentecost with the account then of Pentecost from Acts chapter. Two, and this reading will form the basis then of our sermon here this morning. St. Luke writes, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them, and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others, mocking, said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, and in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Let the congregation then stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the seventh chapter. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Thank you, God. I invite the congregation and to confess our common faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. I, I believe, believe in one, one God, God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, 
the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended to heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. May be seated then as we sing our hymn of the day, Creator Spirit by whose aid. saying, hey, check this out. Something new is happening. 
And it's no different with the grand opening of the church, the Pentecost. We all know that timing is also everything with grand openings. You need to kick things off when people are around. And that's why God actually chooses the festival of Pentecost. It's actually one of the big festivals of the Old Testament. It's part harvest festival, and it's also part religious and national festival. If you put it in today's terms, it's kind of like Thanksgiving and the 4th of July all rolled up into one for the Jews, which is why the city of Jerusalem is packed with pilgrims, hundreds of thousands of visitors. Timing is everything. And we all know God's timing is perfect. So while the city comes together to celebrate the wheat harvest, God brings forth the first harvest of believers. In fact, 3,000 are baptized by the end of the day. And so if you think about it here this morning, that's quite a grand opening. And it all happened around 9 o'clock, we hear today, in the morning. The believers, all 120 of them, are gathered at church on a Sunday morning. They're all in one single room. And there is the sound of this great, mighty, rushing wind. And then tongues of fire rested on each one of them as Jesus was blowing his spirit-filled breath over his church. This is what Jesus had promised in the Gospel of John that he would do. That he would send another comforter, counselor, guide a paraclete, a helper, to bring to mind all that he had said and done. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus. And he is the breath of the church, breathing life into these dry, dead bones. If you go back to Genesis, just as God breathed into Adam, and Adam became a living being. So now God is breathing into his church. And his church is becoming a living being. The Spirit gives breath to his church. Why? Because in order to speak. In order to speak, there must be breath. That's why Jesus is breathing life into his church. So often when we hear this Pentecost event, we kind of focus in on the tongues of fire and the wind and all that sort of stuff, but that's not the main attraction of Pentecost. Those are just the things that set up the main attraction, which is the preaching. Peter's great Pentecost sermon. Filled now with the Spirit, the church cannot remain silent. It must, must speak. She must become a preaching, proclaiming, confessing church. And what is she preaching? She is preaching Christ. And voila, the preaching of the church is custom fit to its hearers. They come from all over the whole known world. We heard from where they all came from today, that Acts reading. They got their own language, they got their own dialect, they got their own customs. If you want to know what this event looked like, walk through a major airport, like O'Hare in Chicago. And as you look at the crowd there and listen to the crowd, it was probably very similar to what was happening on Pentecost. But as we hear this morning, the amazing thing is they're all hearing the good news of Jesus in their own language, in their own tongue. It's kind of like somebody strapping on those headphones, you know, at the UN in New York. And everybody is hearing what the speaker says in their own language. They're hearing Peter and the apostles in their own native tongue. Now, just like we would have been naturally, there's a lot of people there that are pretty skeptical about the whole thing. Some people even believe the apostles are all drunk. Which, if you stop and think about it, is kind of a goofy explanation. Considering it was, as we heard today, only 9 o'clock in the morning, and language skills generally don't improve with drinking. It's not, well, the more you drink, now the more foreign languages I can speak. Well, that's interesting. It's not a result of alcoholic spirits we hear today. This is all a result of the Holy Spirit. And if you would have been there, it would have been quite a day. 
Imagine then maybe even this morning being in that crowd. Hearing about the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ in your own language for the very first time. For a brief moment, it's the Tower of Babel in reverse. The separated world now is actually brought together. Which is why we really can't do a do-it-yourself church at home. Everybody behind their own walls. We're the body of Christ. You can't put your head in one house, your feet, you know, five miles down the road, your heart in another house. No, we're all different parts, but in order for the body to work, the whole body needs to be here. The Tower of Babel and its results sent people scattered all over the world with their own languages. But now as the Lord is rolling out His church, He's gathering them back again into one place. The walls that had divided humanity are now being torn down in Christ. Well, let's be honest, though, about something here this morning. There are times right now when the church appears to be kind of lifeless. Kind of like that valley of dead, dry bones that the prophet Ezekiel saw in the Old Testament. Maybe that kind of even describes your spiritual life right now as well. And the question maybe on our lips is the one that was posed to Ezekiel. Can these dead, dry bones live? Many people are posing that question now about the Christian church in a coronavirus world. Is it going to survive? Talk to a lot of people today as churches now begin to open up. It doesn't matter what stripe of Christianity, what geographic region of the country. There are not many people in the church at all, no matter where you go. And the interesting thing is I saw a study last week that said there's nobody watching the church online anymore either. There was a poll that was taken. I don't know whether these polls are true or not, but they asked people who are members of the church who had been watching their online church services for the first six, eight weeks of quarantine. They said, how many times over the last four weeks have you watched church online? And only 40% of the people said we watched at least one Sunday service in the last four weeks. And then the question was asked, Was it your own church's service? And only 20% said it was their own church's service. So if you put the numbers together, you got about 10, 15% of church members actually now watching their own church service. Even at home, online. And so a lot of people are beginning to pose the question, will the church survive? Can these bones live? Or is Christianity a dead, dying church? Because even if you show up to church on a Sunday, there's no Pentecost pyrotechnics here today. There's no wind, no fire, no tongues. Can the church continue to live and move and breathe, even in this current situation in our generation? But you know what? To ask that question is actually to ask A very important question. Can God raise the dead at the end on the last day? Can he breathe life into the lifeless? And if he can do that, I think he can renew his church today. Because the answer to that question, can the church live as a big, fat, resounding yes? He does breathe life now. He has in the past, and he will in the future. The danger, however, I think, as we come out of this virus situation, is that the church is going to press the panic button and start doing some crazy and wild things. We're going to try to maybe create some sort of Pentecost excitement to the church. We're going to jumpstart the church, maybe put the paddles on her and shock her and try to bring her back to life again. Maybe we'll even say, hey, we need to try to duplicate the Pentecost, grand opening of the church. Maybe that'll bring people back to church. But think about it here this morning. By definition, you can only have one grand opening. 
can't have one every day. Even though some churches are beginning to try it right now, and I think they're going to try it in the future. Can't have a grand opening every Sunday, because then it would become ordinary, mundane, boring even. It'd be the same old wind, same old fire, same old tongues, and then we'd be running off trying to do something new again. Plus, it'd create a lot of problems in the church. What would happen if wind and tongues were a part of every service? We'd end up having a voters meeting, and everybody would argue about it. Ah, we got to shut that wind out in the church. Getting pretty drafty in there every Sunday. And I don't know about those tongues. I'm afraid it's going to singe the carpet. It may singe the new duds I bought for Easter. And the chatter of those languages. I mean, can't we just settle on one and go with it? It's so distracting. See, we can't try to recreate Pentecost. It has to sit there in history where it belongs. Because if we try to recreate Pentecost, there's a big danger there. We end up taking our eyes off of the main event of what Pentecost was. Pentecost wasn't about the wind and the tongues. They didn't convert anybody. In fact, if you were listening today, they were actually sent to the people who had already been converted. What was the thing that converted the people at Pentecost? It was the preaching of the Word of God. That's where the Holy Spirit promises to be found today. It wasn't the Pentecost pyrotechnics that created this explosion of the church and this incredible grand opening. It was the Spirit's power working through the Word. The preaching of Jesus. The preaching of the forgiveness of sins. That's where the Holy Spirit is alive and well today. And that's where Pentecost is still active and happening today, even here in your life. Your baptism is actually your Pentecost day. Each time you hear the word of God is another Pentecost day. The ongoing work of Pentecost is not in a bunch of razzle-dazzle, but it's in the word of God that brings forth new life. And there hasn't been a day in the history of the world in the past 2,000 years since Pentecost in which that word of God has not been proclaimed, and where the Spirit has not been working. So what does all this mean? This is a question that was posed in our reading today, in the book of Acts. What does all this mean? As we get ready to shut the sermon down here this morning, it kind of begs the question, so what? What does it mean for my life? What does it mean for the church? The big thing it means is the church is dead church is alive and well. The Spirit of Christ is here. What's he doing? Breathing life into his church. The Spirit of Christ is breathing life into your lungs. Putting breath into your lungs and words into your ears and then into your mouth so that you can sing the praises of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The Spirit of Christ continues to call to gather, to enlighten, and to sanctify the whole Christian church on earth, and to keep it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. And you're a part of that great, breathing Pentecost church, bearing witness now to a world as we come back and gather again that these dead, dry bones will live. Just as surely as Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity. How do you know that? It's because his life is yours. His life is yours. Because his death is yours. Now we find out today on Pentecost, his spirit is yours. You, my friends, are alive and well in Jesus forever. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds and faith in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. Invite the congregation then to please stand for the prayer of the church.
Let us pray. Almighty God, you have blessed us in love with the Spirit to whom the nations cry and in whom there is forgiveness, life, and salvation. Grant to us, your Holy Spirit, the Comforter whom you have promised, that we and all who call upon his name shall be saved. Help us to treasure in our hearts your mercy and to give ourselves fully to your service. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Yeah. Almighty God, you have ordered all things in heaven and on earth. And we pray this day that you would bless our president, our governor, the Congress of these United States, all who are elected and appointed civil servants, our governors, our local leaders, our mayors throughout our country, that order would be restored, that justice would prevail, that there would be an end to the looting, to the rioting, that you would protect the weak, that the rule of law may stand, that you would preserve life, from conception to its natural end, and peace may reign for the benefit of all. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Hear our prayer. Almighty God, have mercy and spare us. Put an end to the pandemic and restore the countries of the world to their common life. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Hear our prayer. Almighty God, you have given our nation the gift and heritage of freedom. It came at the cost of many lives on battlefields far and near. Receive our thanks for their sacrifice. Give us courage to preserve liberty in our own time and to use it honorably. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty God, you carry the burdens of our lives in your hands. Deliver from illness and suffering all who cry to you for release. Hear us on behalf of the sick, the dying, and those who mourn. Especially this day do we remember Bev, Liz, Stephanie, Ron, Damaris, Joan, Phil, Carolyn, Jason, Sue, Dusty, Harold, Don, Conrad, Sonia, Ken, Jean, Polly, Juanita, Marlis, Paul, Helen, Linda, Haley, Jesse, Vanita, Betty, Shirley, and the families of Harry Brum, Adam Geyer, and Roy Clark. Answer your people, O Lord, and deliver them from their infirmities and their grief by your grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, hear your people for the sake of him who loved us even to death and who lives and calls to himself all who will be saved. You know what we need and those things we should ask in your name. Grant them to us for the sake of our crucified and risen and ascended Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love he blessed us with every spiritual blessing. By the outpouring of the Holy Spirit he empowered his church to be witnesses of Christ to the ends of the earth. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, at his command and with his own words, we receive his testament. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen.
may be seated then as we sing the Agnus Day at the Lamb's High Feast, and we'll begin as we've done here, this side starting to come down the center aisle to receive the sacrament. Through body and blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in body and soul until life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Amen. Stand for prayer. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
The Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. 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 May be seated then for our announcements. <coughs> welcome everyone this morning here in the name of the Lord as we give thanks to God on this Pentecost Sunday for the great blessing that the Lord has poured out his spirit upon the church to give life to this dead dry bones which is our own bones and also the church that God has breathed into his life a life-giving spirit and it's not just on Pentecost Sunday but it's every day as we hear his word proclaimed as our sins are forgiven and we have new life in his name couple quick announcements. First of all, the elders uh, this past week extended the three-service format now through the month of July. So we're going to continue here with 815, 930, 1045 three-service format. To the end of July, we'll be having a voters meeting at the end of July. And at that point in time, we'll take a look at kind of what the current situation is. And then it'll go before the voters at that point in time to kind of say, okay, how do we proceed as we move on with going back to school? Because that hopefully by then we'll know kind of what's going to be happening with school, where we're at. And then we'll make that choice as a congregation, uh, whether we'll be heading back to kind of the normal format or what things will look like at the end of July. So that's kind of the news on that front as we continue moving here into the month of June. Then also, church office hours during the month of June will be the same as we had in May. Sonia, our church secretary, will be here in the middle of the week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, from 9 to 1. Then also, we'll be having here in the bulletin over the next couple of weeks kind of where we're at here with our matching funds here for the Extraordinary uh, campaign. And then uh, also will be a total in there of where we're at for paying down the mortgage. But where we're at here is uh, kind of an amazing thing, as we'll kind of be posting it here. Uh, we're down to probably now with having to raise about $5,000 for matching funds then, which would turn into 10 in order to pay off the mortgage. So this is becoming very doable in the, in the very near future, let alone trying to see that done before Thanksgiving. Now, what that also is going to mean is there's going to still be some more matching funds available in that matching fund account. So we're going to want to continue to keep giving because then that will allow us to pay for our seminary assistant program and then some of the other uh, needed repairs that will be done here to the bulletin. But we'll kind of be laying that all out here uh, that will be in the bulletin. Diane's going to be putting together a report so we kind of have a, a running total here of where we're at and that will kind of help us uh, to meet those goals. So we invite you to continue to give to that and then also to the general fund. But uh, we want to thank people uh, for their generosity here over the last few months. So a lot of good news there on that front. So have a good week here in the name of the Lord. Very blessed Pentecost Sunday as we begin now the season of Pentecost and the season of Holy Trinity as we'll celebrate that here next Sunday as well. So have a very blessed day. We'll look forward to seeing you here next Sunday. We'll conclude our worship then today with our closing hymn, Holy Spirit, Light Divine.